Uh, thank you very much uh, for your nice introduction and uh, good evening to you all. Good evening. So, uh, hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, Nothing? sir. You're audible. Right, right. Right. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the department. Uh, especially Sandar Wansa and Natasha Mitz and the team at the department for inviting me to, to deliver this presentation. Uh, so we'll quickly go into the presentation. We have about uh, 40 slides to discuss. Right. Now, uh, let me share my video as well. Yes, right. Now, uh, as you all are aware, taxes can be imposed in Sri Lanka only by the government. And also, uh, there has to be a legislation in place. Uh, we call it as an act that's part, that is passed in the parliament to impose taxes on the public. So that's why we have uh, Inland Revenue Act to collect income tax. We have SSCL Act to collect SSCL. Like that, for value-added tax, uh, we have the Value-Added Tax Act number 14 of 2002. So this was introduced in 2002 by this act. Basically, what we are discussing uh, in relation to that would be the provisions uh, in the Value Added Tax Act. So this will be the presentation outline. Uh, first, you look at the position of VAC, then some key interpretations or definitions, then the concept of time of supply and registration requirements, uh, goods or services supplied in Sri Lanka, then we'll focus on non-taxable supplies. Then we're on importation of goods. Then the calculation part we payable and the obligations we have under this act. And finally, simplified value-added tax. Right. In this value-added tax uh, act, if you look at section two of the act, that's the charging section. Uh, it says VAT is charged in two situations. Let me uh, read out section two. VAT shall be charged at the time of supply on every taxable supply of goods or, goods or services made in a taxable period by a registered person in the course of carrying on no carrying out a taxable activity in Sri Lanka. So there are some uh, keywords that I have highlighted. We will uh, discuss the meaning of these words in a while. To get a proper understanding about section two, you need to know the meaning of these words. But for the time being, let's try to get a basic understanding about this. That shall be charged, uh, situation A, at the time of supply, on every taxable supply of goods or services. Right. Now, I would like you to make a small note uh, here. Now, supply of goods or services can be divided into two. Supply of goods or services can be divided into two. One is taxable supply of goods or services. Taxable supply of goods or services. The other one is non-taxable supply of goods or services. Right, That is known as exempt supplies. Taxable and non-taxable. This taxable supply of goods and services can again be divided into two. 
supply of goods and services chargeable at the standard rate, supply of goods and services chargeable at zero rate, right? Two types, standard rate and zero rate, right? If you read this again, what is payable on taxable supply of goods or services? So here from the scope of chargeability, it has excluded non-taxable supply of goods and services. Oh, it's same supply. You don't have to pay VAT or you don't have to charge VAT on exempt supplies. It is charged only on taxable supply of goods or services, right? It could be standard rate supplies. It could be zero rated supplies. We will discuss the standard rate, zero rate, and all that uh, during the presentation, right? I just want to make uh, you to understand that that is charged only on taxable supply of goods or services. Made in a taxable period by a registered person. So in order to collect or charge that, first you have to be a registered person. So this is a special authority given to you by the government to collect taxes from the public on behalf of the government. So without a proper, uh, without a proper registration, you can't collect or you can't charge that from your customer. First, you have to be a registered person. Uh, excuse me, Nadi. Another one here. Uh, in the course of carrying on no carrying out a taxable activity in Sri Lanka. We look at meaning of taxable activity in the next slide. So there has to be a taxable activity in Sri Lanka. Right? There has to be a taxable activity in Sri Lanka. That is uh, situation A. Situation B, where shall be charged on the importation of goods into Sri Lanka by any person. When you import goods into Sri Lanka, you have to pay or you have to charge VAT at the time of importation. There, you don't have to be a registered person um, by any person. So we will discuss about uh, VAT on importation uh, during the presentation. So in these two situations, VAT is charged. Uh, the following conditions should prevail for chargeability of VAT under this provision. The, uh, the taxable activity should be carried or not carried out in Sri Lanka. There should be a taxable supply of goods or services. There should be a taxable activity. And under that, there should be a taxable supply of goods or services. Right. And the third one, uh, the person should be a registered person. Now we will look at the meaning of taxable activity. If there is a taxable activity only, there is a wet liability, right? So the act has identified five activities uh, as taxable activities. So if any person does any, any of these activities, so he's doing a taxable activity and he has to charge VAT. So taxable activity means any activity carried on as a business, trade, profession, or vocation other than in the course of employment, right? If you are doing a business, there's a taxable activity. But the employment has been excluded. Employment has been excluded. Uh, Nadeka, sir, excuse yes. me. Sir, can you please put the present uh, slides to presentation? Ah, one? yes. Okay, sorry to disturb, right. sir. No, no. Thank yes. you. Right. <clears throat> so, if you are doing a business, there is a taxable activity. Second one, the provision of facilities to its members or others for a consideration and the payment.
payment of subscription in the case of a club association or organization. You know, in a club, uh, the club provides various facilities to its members. And sometimes club charges uh, subscriptions or membership fees. So that is there's a taxable activity. Right. There is a taxable activity. So the club or the association has to charge uh, value added tax. The third one, anything done in connection with the commencement or cessation of any activity or provision of facilities referred to in A or B. Right? Anything done in connection with the commencement or cessation. If you are opening up a company business, there's a taxable activity. If you are uh, if you are doing something in connection with the uh, liquidation of a company, you are doing a uh, taxable activity. There you have to charge value added tax. Next one, the hiring or leasing of any movable property or the renting or leasing of immovable property or the administration of any property. If you lease out any uh, property, land or building to a third party. It could be a movable property, it could be a uh, immovable property. Or if you're administering any property, then there is a taxable activity there you will have to charge VAT. The fifth one, the exploitation of any intangible property such as patents, copyrights, or other similar assets, where such asset is registered in Sri Lanka or the owner of such asset is domiciled in Sri Lanka. If there is any intangible asset that is registered in Sri Lanka or the owner of the asset uh, is living in Sri Lanka, the usage of that uh, intangible property uh, forms part of taxable activity. So there's a taxable activity. There you have to charge VAT. So these are the activities, the five activities, the act has identified as taxable activities. If you do any of these activities, there is a taxable activity, you have to charge VAT. Right. Now we we'll look at question number one to understand this concept, meaning of taxable activity. A company which is engaged in the business of manufacture of articles has the following income disclosed for the quarter ended 31st uh, December 2022. Under turnover, they have recorded sale of manufactured goods locally, 1.2 million. 1,200 million, export of manufactured goods, 500 million, and other income they have recorded, repair services, 129 million, scrap sales, 35 million, rent income, 5 million, dividend income, 4 million, and interest income on fixed deposits, 2.5 million. So identify whether the said items are chargeable with VAT and state the taxable activity into which the said items fall. Right. So this company is doing a business. They are manufacturing and selling articles. So sale of manufactured goods locally, is it chargeable with VAT? Of course, yes. And uh, because there is a taxable activity, it falls under A, we have five activities here, no? A, B, C, D, E. The sale of manufactured goods locally, one, uh, 1,200 million. It is chargeable with VAT and it falls under item A. Export of manufactured goods, 500 million. Again, that is covered under A. covered under A, that is also chargeable with VAT. Repair services. Uh, 
repair services, 129 million. So it's a part and partial of your business. Part and partial of your business. So that also charge that is also chargeable with VAT, and uh, it falls under item A. Scrap sales, same answer. It is chargeable with VAT, and it falls under item A of taxable activity. Rent income, rent income. If we go back and see item D here under taxable activity, the hiring or leasing of any movable property or renting or leasing of immovable property or administration of any property. So you get rental income by leasing out a property. So it is chargeable with VAT, but it falls under item D. Item D. Then we have dividend income and interest income. So these are not uh, generally treated as business income. Uh, so we don't have to pay VAT on, we don't have to charge VAT on dividend income or interest uh, income on fixed deposits. These are investment income. So these are not covered under taxable activity. So the, therefore, dividend income and uh, interest income on fixed deposits are not chargeable with VAT. Right. As I told you, uh, in order to charge VAT, there should be a taxable activity. And when you are doing a taxable activity, you have to supply. There, there should be a taxable supply of goods or services. Right. There should be a taxable supply of goods or services. Now we are going to uh, understand the meaning of uh, these taxable supplies and goods and services. All have been defined in the Act. So taxable supply means any supply of goods or services made or deemed to be made in Sri Lanka, which is chargeable with tax under this Act and includes a supply charge at the rate of 0% other than an exempt supply. As I told you, non-taxable supplies or exempt supplies, non-taxable supplies or exempt supplies are excluded uh, from the chargeability. So you pay, we, or you charge VAT only on the supply, uh, taxable supply of goods or services. It could be standard rate uh, supplies. It could be zero rate supply. Then that has defined the supply of goods and supply of services as well. So supply of goods means the passing of exclusive ownership of goods to another as the owner of such goods or under the authority of any written law and includes the sale of goods by public auction, the transfer of goods under higher purchase agreement, the sale of goods in satisfaction of a debt, and transfer of goods from a taxable activity to a non-taxable activity. Uh, basically, the meaning of supply of goods is if you are the only of a uh, if you are the only <coughs> owner of a particular good then you pass that legal ownership of that particular good to another person. You being the owner of a particular good, you transfer the ownership to another person. And uh, this includes sale of goods by public auction, transfer of goods under higher purchase agreement, sale of goods in satisfaction of a debt, and transfer of goods from a taxable activ activity to a non-taxable activity. Right. When you are running a business, there is a taxable activity. Now, let's say the, uh, the goods available for sale, you take uh, some goods and donate it to a temple. Right. You are transferring goods from a taxable activity 
to a non-taxable activity. So the access, even if you are transferring it to a non-taxable activity, you are supplying goods, right? Then uh, the supply of services, right? Supply of services means any supply which is not the supply of goods and includes any loss incurred in, in a taxable activity for which an indemnity is due. Now, supplies of two types, supply of goods and supply of services. Supply of goods uh, has been defined. And supply of services uh, has been defined to include all the services other than supply of goods, right? So what is not covered here? Everything is covered. Supply of services mean any supply which is not a supply of goods. Any supply which is not a supply of goods. And include any loss incurred in a taxable activity for which an indemnity is due. If you incur any loss when you are doing a taxable activity, let's say if your uh, inventories are damaged uh, by a flood, then uh, if you are receive an insurance payment, uh, insurance uh, claim, for the loss that you have incurred, the access, it is a supply of service. It is a supply of service. If the loss is indemnified uh, in a taxable activity. Right, we'll look at uh, question number two. Advice whether the following supplies fall within the meaning of taxable supplies for the purpose of chargeability of VAT. Supply of manufactured goods, which is chargeable at the standard rate of 15%. So it is a taxable supply, taxable supply. Export of manufactured goods, which is chargeable at 0%. I told you, uh, taxable supplies can be divided into two standard rate supplies and zero rate of supply. So the export of manufactured goods, which is chargeable at 0% uh, falls uh, within the meaning of taxable supplies. Supply of computer, which is an excellent supply under the first schedule to the act. Supply of computer, which is an excellent supply. And we discussed that we don't have to charge VAT on exempt supplies. So <clears throat> the third one uh, is not a taxable supply for chargeability of VAT. Question number three, advice whether the following transactions fall, with, uh, fall within the scope of VAT as a supply of goods or supply of service for a VAT registered company. Sale of manufactured goods, you are transferring the ownership of the goods to your customer. So it is a supply of goods. Export of manufactured goods, again, a supply of goods. Disposal of machinery, disposal of machinery. Again, what happens is as the owner of that machine, you transfer it to the buyer, the ownership of the machine. So it is also a supply of goods. Donation of manufactured goods to the government. Donation of manufactured goods to the government. What happens is you are transferring goods from a taxable activity to a non-taxable activity. Right? So it is also a supply of goods. Renting of part of business premises. Renting of part of business premises. Here you don't uh, transfer the ownership of 
the property to the tenant, right? So it is not a supply of food, it's a supply of service. Insurance claim received in respect of damaged stocks manufactured by the company, as I told you, if you incur any loss in a taxable activity and the loss, if the loss is indemnified, it should be treated as a supply of service. So the last one is a supply of service. Right. <clears throat> now we will look at uh, the meaning of taxable period. This, this is also one of the highlighted words in the section two. Taxable period means, actually we have two taxable periods, one month taxable period and three months taxable period. So this one month taxable period is applicable to specific persons. For others, the three months taxable period is applicable. Right, uh, a period of one month where any person registered with the simplified value-added tax scheme and accorded registered identified purchaser status. Right? We will discuss about SWAT and uh, RIP status and all that. If anybody is registered under SWAT as RIP, uh, his taxable period is one month period. Second one, where any person has commenced a business or started the project and undertakes to comply with the requirements of section 227 of the Value Added Tax Act. So uh, basically uh, section 227 is applicable where uh, as is applicable when you do a uh, project long-term projects like now let's say if you want to if you want to run a hotel first you have to buy a block of land construct it and um, decorations and all that so it takes a considerable period to make taxable supplies to provide foods and accommodation so it takes a considerable period so until you uh, start making taxable supplies even during the project implementation period you are allowed to register uh, under this act right so that that registration uh, comes under section 227 right if you are registered under 227 of the act then the taxable period must be one month period B, a period of three months commencing respectively on the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, and the first day of October of each year. So we have one month period and two month period, uh, three months period. Uh, one month is applicable for specific uh, persons and for others, the three months period is applicable. And if you are covered under one month period, then if you still want to come under three months period, you can uh, do so with the approval of the Commissioner General. Right. <clears throat> now, uh, we have come to a very important uh, topic in the Value Added Tax Act. That is the time of supply. That's the tax point. At what point we have to charge it? If you take a single transaction, to complete the transaction, there are many activities happening. Right? So the act has to identify the time. At what time you have to charge that? So the act has identified or act has given uh, the time of supply, the tax point in relation to certain situations. Now under 
the time of supply in relation to supply of goods. When you supply goods, what is the tax point? If you look at number two, time of supply in relation to supply of services. So the, these provisions are applicable in relation to supply of services. What's the tax point? 3.3, time of supply in relation to supply made under an agreement providing for periodical payments. When the payments are made in installments periodically, what time? What is the time at which that has to be charged? And 3.4, supply on payment basis as directed by the CDI. So we'll discuss one by one and we'll try to understand uh, this concept of time of supply, right? So in relation to in relation to supply of goods, the act has I given four situations or four activities, right? Out of these four activities, what is the activity that happens first? The, what is the activity that happens first has to be treated as the time of supply. That is the time, that is the tax time, that is the time at which you have to charge. Right. We will look at the uh, activities they have given under supply of goods. Supply of goods shall be deemed to have taken place at the time of the occurrence of one of the following, whichever occurs earlier, the activity that happens first. The issue of an invoice by the supply in respect of the goods. That is the time of issue in the invoice. B, a payment for the goods, including any advance payment received by the supply. That's the time, time of receiving cash. Time of receiving cash. It could be an advance payment. It could be a final payment, right? A payment for the good is due to the supply in respect of such supply. That's the time of recognizing your uh, receivable. The delivery of the goods have been affected. That's the time of delivery. So four activities uh, have been given. So we have to identify the activity, whether you issue the invoice first or whether you collect your money first or whether you deliver your uh, goods. We have to identify the activity that happens first. That is the time of supply. At that point, you have to charge it. Having said that, the, the further says, notwithstanding D above, where an, invoice is, is, where an invoice is issued in respect of goods delivered within 10 days from the date of delivery of goods, the time of supply of such goods shall be deemed to be the time at which the invoice was issued. You deliver the goods and you issue the invoice within 10 days. Within 10 days, you issue the invoice. Then even though the delivery of goods has been effected first, you have to take the date of invoice as the time of supply. Now time of supply in relation to supply of services. Same uh, concept is applicable here as well. The supply of services shall be deemed to have taken place at the time of the occurrence of any of the following, whichever occurs earlier. The service was performed. Payment is received for the service rendered or for future services. That's the time of collecting money. A payment is due for the services rendered or for future services. That's the time of recognizing your receiver. An invoice is issued in respect of the services rendered, right? Again, this 10 days provision is there. If you perform the service today and issue the invoice within 10 days, 
even though the performance of the service has happened first. Still, you have to take the date of the invoice as the time of supply. Right. That's the time of supply in relation to supply of services. Third one, the time of supply in relation to supply is made under an agreement providing for periodical payments. You do a supply under an agreement. The agreement provides for periodical payment. You don't have to make the full payment at the time of purchasing it. Under the agreement, you can make your payments in installments. Right. If that is the case, what is the time of supply? So it has been divided into two. If the supply is under higher purchase agreement, where goods are supplied under high purchase agreement, the supply shall be deemed to have taken place at the time the agreement is entered into. Even though the payments are made in installments, at the time you enter into the agreement, you have to charge VAT. If it is an agreement other than a high purchase agreement, if it is not a high purchase agreement, the time of supply shall be deemed to have taken place when the payment is due or when the payment is received, whichever is earlier. So if it is not a high purchase agreement, you can take the, uh, the receipt date or when it is due to be received. The earlier date can be taken uh, as the time of supply. The next one, time of supply, uh, sorry, supply on payment basis as directed by the Commissioner General. So uh, when we pay value added tax, we have to apply the approval basis con concept. Now, if we look at 3.1 again here, if you deliver the goods today, and if you issue the invoice today, whether you receive money or not, the time of supply is today. So you have to charge, or you have to pay value added tax. In respect of this supply, you will get your money maybe in three, four months time. But you can't wait till you receive money to pay taxes. So we can say we are applying the approval concept uh, to pay uh, value added tax. But when we apply this uh, accrual basis, uh, this may this can have a very, very significant influence uh, on the cash flow. Uh, as an example, I can take some uh, construction companies. They are doing, their amounts are considerable. And also, uh, it takes a considerable time to recover the, the, the money. So, uh, if they have to pay VAT on accrual basis, that's going to be a uh, huge impact on their cash flows. So if you are badly affected by the application of approval basis, then with the approval of the commissioner general, you can apply the cash basis concept. Cash basis concept. Then what happens is you pay it back only after you collect. We call it receipt basis. So generally that is not allowed, but with the approval of the Commissioner General, you can uh, apply the cash basis to charge or pay back. So if the cash basis is approved, then the time of supply is the time of receipt of cash, right? 
3.4, where the Commissioner General directs any registered person to account for the tax on a payment basis under Section 23. The time of supply of goods and services supplied by such person shall be the time at which the payment in respect of such supply is received. Right. Look at question number four. Identify the time of supply in relation to the following circumstances. Goods delivered on 20th December 2021 and the invoice was issued on 7th January 2022. Goods have been delivered on the 20th December. Invoice has been issued on 7th January 2022. Not within 10 days. Not within 10 days. Then you can't take the date of the invoice as the time of supply in that situation. So in relation to this the first one, you have to take the time of supply as 20th December 2021. That's the time of delivery of goods. Number two, the goods were delivered on the 20th December 2021 and the invoice was issued on 27 December 2021. They, have, they have first delivered the goods, but within 10 days, they have issued the invoice then you can take the date of the invoice as the time of supply. Even though you deliver the goods first. So, in relation to that, the, the uh, 27 December 2021, the date of invoice should be taken as the time of supply. Invoice was issued on 27 December 2021 and the goods were delivered on 30th December 2021. That's the other way. First you have issued the invoice. Then after that you have delivered the goods. So in that case, that 10, 10 days rule is not applicable. You have to take the date of invoice as the time of supply, which is 27 December 2021. Right. Now we look at... Uh, as I told you, uh, when we were discussing about Section 2, I told you that only a registered person uh, can charge that. So we will see the registration requirements. Uh, any person registered by CGIR, Commissioner General of Inland Revenue, in the following manners shall be a registered person. It can happen in uh, different ways, the registration. The Commissioner General shall register a person for VAC where an application has been made by any person for registration under Section 10. If you are liable, we will discuss the registration requirement. Uh, you can make an application to register and get the registration from the Commissioner General. And there can be situations where you are liable to register, but uh, you don't go and register. In that case, if the Commissioner General thinks that you should be a registered person, they will be taken and you will be registered. That is called forced registration. Even though you have not made any application to register, you will be taken and you will be forcedly registered. Whatever the way the registration happens, after you register, you will have to start charging well. Right. Requirement for the registration. Who are the persons who are liable to register? Who are liable to register? So this registration can happen based on your historical data or based on your estimated data. Right. So we will see the requirements. Every person who carries or no carries out a taxable activity in Sri Lanka shall register for VAT. As I told you, there has to be a taxable activity in Sri Lanka shall register if 
that is the, the first one is based on your historical data the value of taxable supplies value of taxable supplies why am i highlighting this value of exempt supplies has been excluded so you have to take only the value of taxable supplies in a taxable period it could be a one month period or it could be a three month period has exceeded 20 million at the end of the taxable period or the total value of taxable supplies has exceeded 80 million in any 12 months period if the value of taxable supplies has exceeded 30 million uh, 20 million in a particular taxable period or for 12 months period if it has exceeded 80 million then you are liable to register right so this is based on your historical data after the taxable period or after 12 months period you look back and see whether you have exceeded if you have exceeded then you are liable to register the second scenario you can the based on your historical data you are not liable to register you have not exceeded but you have reasonable grounds to believe that you will exceed the value of taxable supplies will exceed these thresholds 20 million in a taxable period or 80 million in any 12 months period so if you have reasonable grounds to believe that you will ex likely to exceed then you have to register at any time there are reasonable grounds to believe that the total value of taxable supply is likely to exceed 20 million in any taxable period or 80 million in any 12 months period then this registration is compulsory if you are if the value of taxable supplies has exceeded or it's likely to exceed then this registration must be done but if you are below the threshold let's say if the value of your taxable supplies is less than this threshold it doesn't mean that then you are not liable to register you are not liable to register but still you are entitled to register after the taxable period or after the 12 months period when you calculate your value of taxable supplies you are not exceeded you are not exceeded so you are not liable to register but you are entitled to register you make an application uh, to register and get the registration this is known as voluntary registration you are not liable to register you are entitled to register but this is actually uh, subject to the conditions or approval of the commissioner general but any person who does not come within the threshold cannot register for VAT. however the commissioner general of Finland may consider voluntary registration subject to conditions determine whether the following persons are required to be registered under the VAT tag required to be registered a company which is engaged in sale of manufactured goods with an annual turnover of 500 million annual turnover of 500 million what is the annual threshold we had it's 80 million so the company's value of turnover has exceeded 80 million so in the first situation the company is required to register Second one, any individual who provides consultancy uh, services with an annual income of 60 million. Annual income is less than 8 million, so he is not required to register. Next one, a company which is engaged in the sale of locally purchased goods with an annual turnover of 350 million. Again, the annual threshold has been exceeded 80 million. It's more than 80 million so 
that company is required to register under the value added tax act. Right. Under section two, the charge instruction, the taxable activity should be carried or no carried out in Sri Lanka. Right. This has also been explained in section 9 of the act. If there is a taxable activity carried or no carried out in Sri Lanka, you are liable. Then you are you have to charge for it. If there's a taxable activity outside Sri Lanka, then you don't have to charge VAT. So this has to be uh, explained. So it has been done in section 9. Goods or services shall be deemed to be supplied in Sri Lanka where the supplier carries or no carries out a taxable activity in Sri Lanka. If you are doing your taxable activity here, then you are supplying your goods and services here in Sri Lanka. And the goods are in Sri Lanka at the time of supply. If the goods are here, then these are supplied in Sri Lanka. And the services are performed in Sri Lanka by the supplier or his surgeon. If you perform your services outside Sri Lanka, then it is not covered under the VAT score. Right. Question number six. Advice whether a company engaged in the business of providing management consultancy services is chargeable with VAT on the following transactions. Services rendered in Sri Lanka to clients in Sri Lanka. Services rendered in Sri Lanka to clients in Sri Lanka. So it is chargeable with VAT. Services rendered in Sri Lanka to clients outside Sri Lanka. Whoever your clients are, if you perform your service here, you are supplying your services in Sri Lanka. So it is chargeable with VAT. Third one. The services rendered outside Sri Lanka to clients outside Sri Lanka. Services rendered outside Sri Lanka to clients outside Sri Lanka. So it is not covered in this scope of VAT. Since we have performed the service outside the country. So it is not chargeable with VAT. Right. Now we will look at the supplies which are not taxable. Now we have discussed about the taxable supplies in classification. Uh, now we will look at the supplies which are not taxable or generally known as exempt supplies. So these uh, under exempt supplies, the act has given certain goods and services. So if any good door service is listed under the exempt list, exempt uh, schedule. We don't have to charge or pay back on these goods or services. So I have given you a separate um, PDF document uh, with the list of exempt goods and services. I'm not going to, it's a detailed uh, document. I'm not going to uh, discuss that now. You can leisurely uh, have a look. And when you go, go through it, these goods and services have been listed under three headings. Have been listed under three headings. Supply or import. If anything is uh, listed under supply or import, at the time of importation, it is tax free. And also at the time of supply, when you supply that good to your customer, it is tax free. It is not taxable. So some goods or services have been listed only under supply. So when you supply only, at the time of supply, you don't have to pay back. But when you import, since it is not covered there, then you'll have to 
pay charge or pay back on importation. If something is covered under import, on importation, we don't have to pay VAT, but at the time of supply, these are subject to VAT. So please have a look. Uh, the VAT exam schedules and the goods and services. What are the goods and services that have been treated as exam supplies? Right. Now, part two of section two, vector on importation. As I told you, when, we, when you import goods into Sri Lanka, then we'll have to charge back, right? So this is uh, charged and collected uh, by the Sri Lanka customs as a custom duty. So VAT on importation of goods shall be charged, levied and collected as if it is a custom duty. So uh, for that, when you import goods into Sri Lanka, so after you import, if you are not a registered person, now we discuss about registration. So if you are not a registered person, and if you are going to import goods into Sri Lanka, after you import goods within 14 days, you have to inform the Commissioner General that you have imported goods before you clear it, you have imported goods and you want to clear it. Then the Commissioner General will give you a registration number to clear the goods. This is, this is not a permanent registration, it's called as temporary registration. Only for that purpose, you do a registration. Every person who is an importer of goods into Sri Lanka shall notify the Commissioner General not later than 14 days prior to the clearing of such goods that he has imported such goods and obtained from the Commissioner General an identification number for the clearing of such goods. The said notification is not required in the following circumstances. Importation under the personal baggage. Uh, person who is already registered for VAT under Section 10. That's the normal registration we discussed earlier. If you are already registered there, then you don't have to get a permanent registration uh, to temporary registration to import goods into Sri Lanka. You can use your permanent uh, registration number to clear the goods. Right. Now we have come to the calculation part how to calculate the VAT payable. How to calculate the VAT payable, right? The amount of VAT payable is computed as follows. Output VAT, value of supply into tax rate. That's basically the tax you collect from your customers. Less allowable input VAT. Allowable input VAT. That is the VAT you pay on your purchases. Yeah. From the amount you have collected from your customers, you deduct the amount you already paid to your suppliers and the balance. The difference between these two is the VAT payable. If your input is less than the output, there is a VAT payable. That's the amount you have to pay to the government. Right. Now we will discuss the output VAT and allowable input VAT uh, and see how to calculate the VAT payable. Output VAT is computed by applying relevant VAT rates on the value of supply of goods or services. We have to take the value of supply and apply the tax rate. So what is the value of supply? Value of supply has been given in the act in relation to certain circumstances, but for you all, I have taken only the basic rule. Value of supply, if the supply is for a consideration in money, if you supply goods or services and if you receive money, 
what is the value of supply? Consideration minus VAT or open market value, whichever is higher. You have to take the higher value of the open market value or consideration minus VAT. Uh, generally, these two figures should be the same value. Generally, because you, you sell your products or you sell your goods or services at the market value. But this may not happen. You may not sell your goods or services at the market value when you are dealing with group companies. When you are dealing with group companies, uh, when the transactions are happening between group companies, so transactions may not happen at the open market. If you are if you are supplying it at a price lesser than the market value, for VAT purposes, you have to take the market value, right? So you have to be very careful. You will have to pay VAT on the market value, even though you have invoiced and collected a lesser amount if the transactions are not happening at the market value. So if the supply is not for a consideration in money or partly in money, again, you have to take the market value. Uh, people, uh, now I think you have a, understanding about SSCL. So sometimes businesses charge SSCL from their customer. Sometimes they don't. When they charge SSCL from their customers, do we have to pay VAT on SSCL as well? Or first you calculate VAT or later you calculate SSCL if you are charging it from your customer. So the answer is here. Consideration minus VAT. From the total consideration you are getting, you can deduct only the VAT component. That's the value of supply. On that, you have to apply the VAT rate and compute the output VAT. That means if you are charging other taxes from your clients, you will have to pay VAT on those taxes as well. Right. That's the value of supply. So on that, we apply the VAT rate, tax rate, to compute the output VAT. So what are the tax rates applicable now? The following rates are applicable on the value of sub, uh, taxable supply of goods or services. Zero rate. And standard rate. Zero rate means uh, zero percent. Standard rate is 15. We had 12% earlier, and before that, we had 8%. But the currently applicable standard rate is 15. Now, again, when we are going to compute the output VAT, now we have two supplies, zero rated supplies and standard rate supplies. Now we will look at the supplies that are chargeable at zero rate. All the other supplies are chargeable at the standard rate. Right. Zero rated supplies. In relation to these supplies, uh, the applicable VAT rate is tax rate is zero percent. So these are the supplies that are treated as zero rated supplies. Goods shall be zero rated where the supplier has exported such goods for pay uh, for which payment is received in foreign currency through a bank in Sri Lanka within a period of six months from the end of the taxable period of such, of which such exportation has taken place. If you export goods and if the export proceeds are brought into Sri Lanka through the banking system, through the banking system, within six months after you uh, export goods, that is a zero rated supply. 
that is a zero rate of supply, right? Uh, this uh, foreign currency remittance requirement was not there earlier. This was introduced uh, recently because people, when uh, when Sri Lankan rupee was depreciating against other currencies, then people used to park their foreign currencies as proceeds outside the country to get the benefit of depreciating rupee. So the government came up with this condition, if you want to enjoy, if you want to apply 0% on your sub, on your exports, you have to bring the exports proceed through the banking system within six months. So if you don't bring, you can't, you can't apply 0% even on your exports, right? That is export of goods. Some services, specific services have been given in the act as zero rated supply uh, zero rated supplies services shall be zero rated where the supply of services are directly connected with any movable or immobile property outside sri lanka uh, the repair of any foreign ship aircraft or any merchant ship any goods imported into sri lanka for the purpose of re export and uh, under entry port trade a copyright, patent, license, trademark, or similar intellectual property right. The international transportation, computer software development, client support services, and provision of services to overseas buyers by a government buying office. So I didn't <coughs> go into detail. Uh, these are some specific pro uh, services that are treated as zero rated supplies so other than that all the other general services provided by any person in sri lanka to another person outside sri lanka to be consumed or utilized outside sri lanka shall be zero rated provided that the payment for such payment in full has been received in foreign currency from outside Sri Lanka through a bank in Sri Lanka within six months, right? Uh, in respect of other general services, if you provide the service in Sri Lanka and, and if the recipient of that service is a person outside Sri Lanka and if the recipient is consuming or utilizing your service outside Sri Lanka. And if you get foreign currency uh, remitted through a bank within six months, you can apply zero rate on those services as well. Right. In the case of zero rated supplies, no tax shall be charged in respect of such supply. When you apply 0% on the value of supply, basically you are charging no tax. So no tax shall be charged. The supply shall in all other respect be treated as a taxable supply. Though you are not charging any tax on zero rated supplies, you have to treat it as a taxable supply. So if you look at zero rated supplies and exempt supplies, as far as output that is concerned, there is no any difference. On exempt supplies, you are not charging back. So the output rate is zero. On zero rated supplies, the applicable rate is zero. So output rate is zero. So in respect uh, of zero rated supplies and exempt supplies, as far as output that is concerned, there is no any difference. I'll explain uh, the difference between these two in a while. Right, question number seven, determine the applicable tax rate in respect of following supplies, whether it is 15% or uh, whether it is 
zero percent. Export of goods, zero percent. Sale of goods to an exporter, you are not exporting. Your customer is exporting. You are just providing uh, goods to an exporter. It is not zero rated. You have to apply the standard rate. Consultancy services provided outside Sri Lanka for payment in Sri Lanka. Consultancy services provided outside Sri Lanka. So this is not covered in the VAT score. Consultancy services provided outside Sri Lanka. You are not delivering or performing your services here in Sri Lanka then it is not a part of the scope. So this is the third one is outside the scope of VAT. Since the service has been performed outside Sri Lanka. Consultancy services provided in Sri Lanka to a client outside Sri Lanka for payment in foreign currency and the services consumed outside Sri Lanka. All the conditions have been met. It has been provided in Sri Lanka. Client is a person outside Sri Lanka. Payment is in foreign currency and the service has been consumed outside Sri Lanka. All the conditions have been satisfied. So it, to, it is a zero rated supply. You would apply zero rate on that. Next one, consultancy services provided in Sri Lanka to a client outside Sri Lanka for payment in foreign currency and the service is consumed in Sri Lanka. If the service is consumed in Sri Lanka, you can't apply 0% on that service. So it has to be at the standard rate, which is 15%. Consultancy services provided in Sri Lanka to a client outside Sri Lanka for payment in Sri Lanka, for payment in Sri Lankan rupees and the service is consumed in Sri Lanka. So the payment has not been made in foreign currency, it has been made in rupees, and the service uh, has also been consumed in Sri Lanka. Two of the conditions have not been satisfied. So you can't apply 0% on that. It has to be the standard rate, 15%. Right. Now, uh, as I told you, when we apply when we apply the concept of time of supply whether you receive money or not you are liable to charge or you are liable to pay back right so when you are dealing with actual concept bad debts can happen bad debts can happen as an example, you say you deliver the goods today, you issue the invoice today, and you will get your money in three months' time. Right. You have to pay back today under the concept of time of supply. You have to pay back today. Right. Not only that, even the value of your supply, you haven't received it. But you have to pay back today. You you make the payment out of your own money. Then after three months, when you go and ask for money, the client, uh, let's say, is bankrupt. So he can't pay. Now, on that supply, you have already paid VAT. So this happens uh, when you apply in cash approval basis. So, the act has identified this. The act says, right, if you incur any bad debt, you can deduct it. No problem. At the time of uh, becoming that, that bad, you can set it off against your uh, output value. And if you recover that later, the bad debt. If you write, when you write off, you can uh, deduct it. 
and when you re if if you are able to recover it later, then you will have to include after you recover it, right? So that is the adjustment for bad debts. In ascertainment, in ascertaining the amount of tax payable and amount of tax on uh, bad debt incurred in the taxable activity and which has become bad during such period shall be deducted. So you can deduct. If any amount is subsequently received, the amount received shall be treated as a taxable supply during the taxable period in which it was received and shall be liable to tax. If you recover it later, at the time of recovery, you will have to include it and pay. So question number eight, based on the following information, compute the output VAT. Compute the output VAT for the taxable period in the 31st December 2020. How to calculate the output well? First, we have to calculate, um, identify the value of supply and we'll have to apply the applicable VAT rate on that. Right. Sale of goods locally, 52.8 million. 52.8 million sale of goods locally. Sale of, uh, sorry, export of goods, 15.3 million. Bad debts in respect of local sales, 1.5 million. Export sales, 1 million. Recovery of bad debts of local sales, 1.8 million. 1.8 million. So first, we have to calculate the value of taxable supply. Then you'll have to apply the tax rate. So sale of goods locally, 52.8 million. From 52.8 million, we can deduct the bad debts incurred in relation to local sales, which is 1.5 million, and deduct 1.5. And they have recovered bad debts, 1.8 million. So 52.8 million minus 1.5 million plus 1.8 million. 53.1 million, that is the value of supply in relation to uh, supply of goods locally. 53.1 million, then on that we apply the VAT rate. So on local sales, you have to apply the standard VAT rate, which is 15%. So on 53.1 million, you apply 15%. So your output that comes to seven million nine hundred and sixty-five thousand. Seven million nine hundred and sixty-five thousand. Right. Here we have exports as well. Export of goods fifteen point three million. Bad debts one million. So from fifteen point three, you deduct one million, and the value of supply comes to fourteen point three million. And on that, you apply the tax rate, which is 0%, and your output VAT is 0. Right. Now, that is how you should calculate your output VAT. Right. Then we can, from your output VAT, we can deduct input VAT. So we are now going to discuss about the input VAT uh, and the restrictions applicable in deducting input VAT. So input VAT, we have two types of input VAT. When you buy goods or services from another registered person locally, when you buy goods or services from another registered person, he will charge that from you, right? So when you purchase, you will have to pay that on your purchases, right? So that is a that is an input VAT. And also, when you import goods into Sri Lanka, part two of section two, when you import goods into Sri Lanka, I told you that you have to uh, VAT is charged. By custom. So that VAT is uh, that VAT also 
forms part of your input query. So you have two types of input query. Uh, tax charged by another registered person or the tax paid by him on the importation. Right. Claim of input value. Now we have input value. Now we are going to deduct it from your output value. Registered person is entitled at the end of such period uh, to credit for so much of his input tax as is allowable and then to deduct such amount from any output tax that is due from him. Right. However, any person adopting a payment basis of accounting, that's a cash basis, is entitled to claim credit on so much of his input tax as is allowable only in respect of, of a supply for which the payment of the tax has been made by such person. So if you are authorized to apply cash basis, when you are going to deduct your input where you have to apply the same basis in relation to uh, input wet as well. You can deduct input wet only after you make the payment because you take in, uh, you take uh, output wet based on cash basis. You have to take your input also on cash basis if you are authorized to apply the cash basis. Right. Now, when we are going to deduct uh, input VAT from our output VAT, so all input VAT taxes are not allowed. All input taxes are not allowed. So there are some restrictions. Uh, there are some restrictions in deducting input VAT. So some input VAT uh, it's not allowed to be deducted. So now we are going to discuss about the input uh, restrictions of input tax claim. Any input tax attributable to the supply of goods or services received shall not be deducted in respect of the following. So in relation to the following, uh, the input tax, shall not be deducted from the output value. First one, input tax in respect of motor vehicles. Input tax in respect of motor vehicles other than uh, they have given some motor vehicles from A to B. E. So that means generally you can't deduct input value on motor vehicles, but in, re <coughs> in respect of the motor vehicles listed under A to E here, that input weight can be claimed. So what are the situations where we can claim input weight on motor vehicles? If it relates to a motorcycle or bicycle or motor coaches provided by an employer for the transportation of his employees. Motor vehicles used for excursion tours or for the transportation of tourists or transportation of goods or hiring cars. Or motor vehicles forming part of any stock in trade of any taxable activity. So in relation to these circumstances, you can claim input back on motor vehicles. Other than that, you can't deduct input back on motor vehicles. That's number one. Number two. Input tax not connected with the taxable activity. Input tax not connected with the taxable activity. If you can remember our original classification of sup, uh, supply of goods and services, I divided that into two taxable supply of goods and services, non taxable supply of goods and services. If your input tax relates to a non-taxable activity, you can't deduct that input back. If the supply of goods or services received is not connected with the taxable activity or not included in the value of taxable supply, you can't deduct that. 
now I can explain about the difference between zero rated supplies and XM supplies. As I explained, there's no difference as far as output rate is concerned between these two. No output is charge, output is zero. But if you, when you are going to deduct input VAT in relation to zero rated supplies, the input tax or the input VAT can be deducted because that is, that is a part of your taxable supply. But input VAT in relation to XM supplies or non-taxable supplies cannot be deducted. Right, that is the difference between zero rated than exempt supplies. So number three, input tax not supported by a tax invoice or customs goods declaration. So in respect of your uh, local purchases, you have to have a document called tax invoice. We will discuss about this uh, in the next slide. That document is called tax invoice. And if it relates to an importation of goods, if, if the input is relates to importation of goods, then it has to be uh, supported uh, by a customs goods declaration known as CUSDEC or other authenticated document issued by the Director General of Customs. So if you don't have any of these documents to support your input, you are not allowed to deduct that input from your output. Right. Next one, next restriction. Input tax not connected within the prescribed period. So the act has given a time period to, to deduct your input. If you, if you don't deduct your input during that period, you are not allowed to deduct it later. Now, if it is uh, relating to a tax invoice, if it is relating to a tax invoice, you have to make the claim or you have to deduct it within 12 months from the date of the tax invoice. Then after that, you can't deduct it. Within 12 months from the date of the tax invoice, you have to deduct it from your output. And if it, in the case of a customs goods declaration, you have 24 months, 24 months period to deduct it from your output. So after 12 months period, or after 24 months period, in respect of these uh, tax invoices and CUSDEX, you can't deduct it. The next restriction, if you can remember in relation to zero rated supplies, um, I explained that if you want to if you want to enjoy the zero rated status, you have to make sure that funds are remitted through the banking system within six months. Right. If you don't bring, what will happen? It is not a zero rated supply. Then then it's a standard rate supply. Then we'll have to apply 15% tax on that, right? And also, here, if the payment in respect of supply of goods or services referred to in subsection one of section seven, that's the zero rated part that we discussed, is not received in foreign currency through a bank in Sri Lanka within a period of six months, from the end of the taxable period of which such exportation has taken place or the supply of such service is provided, as the case may be, then you can't deduct your input worth in relation to that supply. Your input worth is not allowed. And it is treated as a supply that is chargeable at the standard rate if you don't bring foreign currency to Sri Lanka. Right, these are the restrictions that are applicable uh, that are applicable when you are going to claim input back. Right, now we will look at uh, question number nine. 
the following information is extracted from the books of accounts of PQR Limited. Engage in the business of manufacturing of goods for the taxable period in the 31st December 2022. All transactions given below are exclusive of VAT where applicable. Without VAT. Output. Supplies to VAT registered person, 3.5 million. That's the value of supply. Supplies to non VAT registered persons, 2.5 million. Input. Import of raw materials, 3 million. Local purchase of raw materials from wet registered persons, 1.5 million. Purchase of raw materials not supported with tax invoices, 1 million. Salaries and wages, 1.8 million. So calculate wet payable for the taxable period in the 31st uh, December 2022. Right. Now, first, what should we do? We have to calculate the output VAT. How it is computed? First, we take the value of your output, value of supply, and on that, we apply the tax rate. Right. Supplies to VAT registered person. Value of supply, 3.5 million. Three point five million, and the applicable tax rate is fifteen percent. So the output that comes to five hundred and twenty-five thousand. Second one supplies to non-vet registered persons. So if you are registered, if you are liable, whether your customer is registered or not is not your problem. If you are registered, you have to charge it from all the customers, whether they are registered or not. So supplies to non-net registered person, the value of supply 2.5 million. On that, we apply the tax rate, which is 15. The output that comes to 375,000. So total value of supply 6 million and total output that comes to 900,000. Right. Now, this is your output, and we are going to deduct input now. Import of raw materials at the time of importation, you would have paid 15% tax uh, at the time of importation. So, we are deducting it 3 million into 15%, 450,000. We can deduct it. And local purchase of raw materials from that registered persons. When you buy locally from that registered person, they would have charged that and you would have paid that. So on 1.5 million, if you apply 15%, comes to 225,000. Next one, purchase of raw materials not supported with tax invoices. As I told you, you have to have a tax invoice or a cost deck to support your invoices. If you don't have these documents in place, you are not allowed to uh, deduct the input. So in this case, purchase of raw materials not supported with tax invoices is not allowed to be claimed. Not allowed due to non-availability of tax invoices. The next one, salaries and wages. So when you pay salaries and wages, you don't have to pay. You don't have to pay VAT because you employee, employees are not charging VAT from you. So the, that is not applicable at all. So salaries and wages not applicable. So total out input comes to six hundred and seventy-five thousand. So your total output nine hundred thousand. Total input comes to six hundred and seventy-five. The balance three hundred and Sorry, 225 is the balance back payable. 
Right. Next question. In the above question, it should be corrected as nine. In the above question nine, in addition to the output mentioned, if the company has exported goods amounting to rupees 750,000 and supplied XM goods amounting to rupees 1 million, compute the VAT payable for the taxable period in the 31st December 2022. So in addition to those standard rate supplies, here we have a zero rated supplies, export and also a non-taxable supply. So how we should incorporate these and how to calculate the VAT payable when there are zero rated than XM supplies. Right. Supplies liable at standard rate that we have already cal calculated. Total value of su taxable supply is 6 million. Uh, on that, we apply 15% rate. So the VAT comes to 900,000. Next one, supplies liable at zero rate. That is export. 750,000. On that, the applicable tax rate is zero. The output rate is zero. Then we can calculate the total of these two. That's the taxable, the value of taxable supplies. 6,750,000. Output VAT comes to 900,000. Then we have made uh, an XM supply, 1 million. There is no any tax rate on that, no output VAT on that. So the total value of supply comes to 7,750,000 and output VAT comes to 900,000. Right. Now we are going to deduct input VAT. But here, you just can't take the total input tax and deduct because here we have here we have an XM supply. When we deduct input VAT, you can't deduct input VAT if it is related to a XM supply. So we will have to remove that and we can claim only input VAT applicable to taxable uh, supplies. So the total input VAT we have uh, calculated here 675,000 and I have divided it by the total value of supply which is 7,750,000 and I have multiplied it by 6,750,000. That is the value of taxable supplies. To identify the input VAT that is attributable to taxable supplies. So the answer comes to 587,903. Right. Then from your output, you deduct this and the balance But payable comes to 312,097 rupees. Right. That is how uh, the wet payable is computed. computed. So now we will look at some uh, obligations or some administrative provisions that are there in the Value Added Tax Act. The tax invoice, uh, that is a very important document uh, when you work in, you know, in uh, audit firms or even in your non-audit uh, sectors, you just see in this word tax invoice, this very, very important document, you already know that you can't deduct input bread if you misplace your original tax invoice. So this is very, very important. Um, a registered person who makes a taxable supply shall issue a tax invoice within 28 days after the time of such supply. If he has made a written request within 14 days from the time of supply, 
uh, stating that he's a registered person or deemed to be a registered person. So if you are a registered person, you will have to inform your um, you will have to inform your supplier that you are a registered person and if they are charging back from you, you must need the tax invoice. Right? Then your supplier has to issue a tax invoice within 28 days after the uh, supply is made. And if uh, you don't have to make a request again and again, the first request is adequate. Then after that, when you are dealing with him, they know that you are already a registered person and you should be given the tax invoices always. The composition of a tax invoice, what are the components that should be there in a tax invoice? The name, address, and the registration number of the supplier, the person who makes the supply. His name, address, and his number should be there. And also the name, address, and the person to whom the supply was made, the customer's details should be there. The date on which the tax invoice was issued and its serial number. You have to maintain these invoices in a serial order. The date and the number. The date of supply and description of the goods or services. Date of supply. And what have you supplied under this? description of goods, the quantity or volume of the supply, value of the supply, the tax charge, and the total, uh, and the consideration for the supply. You have to show the value of the supply VAT separately and the total consideration separately. And finally, the words taxing noise, the words taxing noise, these com uh, components should be there in the invoice. Otherwise, it is not treated as a valid tax invoice. If you don't have a valid tax invoice, you can't deduct your input well. Right. Tax invoice on imports, as we discussed, uh, the customs goods declaration or any document uh, authenticated by the Director General of Customs. Uh, can be treated as the tax invoice on imports. Retaining copies of tax invoices, when you issue your invoices, the original has to be given to your uh, customer. And the copy should be kept with you for five years, five years after the, the taxable period. The original of the tax invoice shall be issued to the person to whom the supply was made and the duplicate of such invoice shall be retained by the person who makes such supply for a period of five years after the expiry of the taxable period. Right. So issue of copies of tax invoices. So as you are aware, in respect of a certain particular supply, you can't issue two invoices. It is illegal to issue more than one invoice in respect of a certain supply. So if the uh, if the original of the tax invoice, uh, invoice is lost or misplaced or damaged, then you can't issue another original, right? You can't issue another original tax invoice. What you can do is you can take a copy and issue, marking it clearly as a copy so this, this the provision the provisions are there it is not lawful to issue more than one tax invoice for each supply if a registered person claims to have lost the original tax invoice the person who makes the supply may issue to such registered person a copy clearly marked copy only right issue of non tax invoices where where you are dealing with uh, persons who are not registered with VAT. When your customer, sorry, when your customer is uh, not VAT registered, then you don't have to issue a tax invoice to him because he is not going to claim input VAT. So you can issue a general commercial invoice, but in the invoice, you can 
show the total concentration, including the tax component, and you can issue a general uh, commercial invoice. So it is not treated as a tax invoice. Where the recipient of a supply is not a registered person, such supplier shall issue an invoice giving the total consideration of supply, including the tax charge, and invoice issued under this uh, subsection shall not be considered as a tax invoice. Right. Then after you get in the registration, uh, you have to submit VAT returns. You have to submit VAT returns. Uh, that's the obligation we have. If you don't submit the England Revenue, <coughs> England Revenue Department can impose penalties on late submissions as well. So uh, filing of VAT returns, you have to, I think you, you would have seen VAT returns. We have, uh, you can see output value of supply, tax rate, output VAT and input VAT that payable so all that's there in the wet return you have to fill it and submit uh, there is a deadline to submit every registered person is required to furnish the back return not later than one month after the expiry of the taxable period so whether the one month or three month uh, taxable period after that, within one month, you have to submit the VAT return to the Inland Revenue Department. And also payment of tax. Payment of tax. The VAT payable that we computed earlier has to be settled like this. Um, when your taxable period is one month period, or no before the 20th of the month, following the end of the taxable period. After the month, or no before the 20th of the following month. You have to calculate and pay the debt payable. And in relation to uh, quarterly taxable periods, where three months taxable period is applicable, on monthly basis, each month you have to pay or no before the 20th of the uh, following month. And if there's a balance, you can adjust it at the end after the quarter. It also has to be uh, settled on or before the 20th of the following month. Right. Now, uh, we have come to the final uh, part of our presentation. Simplified value-added tax. Simplified value-added tax. Uh, this was... Recently, this was proposed to be removed completely uh, from the VAT system, but uh, because of the pressure from the affected uh, persons, the government has decided to postpone the cancellation to next year. Uh, so very important system um, operating under the VAT law. So we will see uh, why it was introduced and uh, what are the benefits of having a simplified value-added tax system and how it works. So this was introduced in 2011 to simplify the operation of a set system, operation of VAT system and minimize the transactions with regard to VAT collection and refund. Now, uh, let me give you an example. Now, if you are an exporter, your output VAT is always zero. But you are allowed to deduct your input under the provisions of the Act. So when your output VAT is zero and you deduct, when you deduct your input, you will end up with a refund at the end. You don't have to pay to the government. The government has to pay to you. Right? So this now what will happen? Now there is a refund. Okay. Now you submit the return to the uh, Inland Revenue Department. Just after you submit the return on the following day, can you go and take the refund? No. Right. 
they will have to verify, they will have to audit and verify that what you have requested is genuine or no. Whether you have, whether this is a genuine refund or not, whether you are really entitled or not. Then they will do an audit and confirm, right, okay, you are entitled for a refund. Then come and take it. So this process will take a considerable period. And this is not so, I mean, it's not a, just because we request a refund, the department doesn't give, they, they will check 100% of your input to see whether uh, the refund is genuine or not, if they are satisfied only though. So this takes time. So until this process is completed, you won't get your money back, right? So this is your money that is going here and there and rounds and rounds, right? This is your money. So what will happen? The cost of your funds will go up. Then you don't have money to run your operations. So you may have to borrow, you may have to increase your bank over of facility, right? So this will create an additional cost. Then what will happen? To cover up that, you will have to improve your prices. When you are increasing your prices in the global market, uh, the demand will reduce when we are increasing the prices. Then finally, this will affect our export and economy. So to minimize these issues, the government came up with this SWAT system. Uh, they are, what happens is, persons who are entitled for refunds can register as registered identified purchasers. They are registered as registered identified purchasers. And those who are supplying to these purchasers are registered as registered identified suppliers. We have two types of registrations under SWAT. Registered identified purchasers. Uh, those are the persons who are generally entitled for refund. As an example, an export. Persons who are supplying to these purchasers are registered as uh, registered identified suppliers. So we have purchasers and suppliers under this scheme. So uh, right, how? Uh, does SWAT operate? All these RIPs, registered identified purchasers, are provided with SWAT credit vouchers by the Inland Revenue Department. Some of you would have seen them. It's like a you know voucher book, like a checkbook, right? So it is given by the Inland Revenue Department, the serial order, right? When you now, when you have a, only RIPs can uh, get the set vouchers. Huh? So when you have a set vouchers with this book, when you purchase from a RIS, this RIS registered identified supplier then that supplier has to charge wet from you. He has to charge wet from you. So he will issue a tax invoice, but suspending the tax payment. So this is called as suspended tax invoice. It is not a tax invoice we discussed earlier. This is special tax invoice operating under this uh, SWAT, uh, where SWAT is applicable to the RIPs. So RIS issues a suspended tax invoice to the RIP. Then 
RIP takes a voucher and writes the amount and give it to the RIP gives it to the RIS supplier. He doesn't pay wet in cash. He doesn't pay wet in cash. So refunds will not generate. It's only that voucher that is going rounds and rounds now. Right? So this cash flow issues uh, do not arise uh, because of the SWAT system now. And if the RIS does not claim the SWAT credit voucher, such supply shall be deemed to be a taxable supply. Now, uh, from the RIS uh, point of view, he has to collect that um, credit voucher from the RIP. If the RIP doesn't give the credit voucher or if, if the RIS is unable to collect it from the RIP, then that is not treated as a suspended supply. It is treated as a taxable supply. On that, we will have to pay uh, tax at the standard rate. So make sure when you are working also, make sure all your credit vouchers are received by your um, registered identified purchasers. Right. Now we'll look at uh, the persons who are eligible to register under uh, SRIPs. The following persons registered under SWAT scheme are called registered identified purchasers. Exporter of articles or ser services where zero rated suppliers can register, can register under the SWAT scheme as RIPs. Registered, ident uh, registered person engaged in any strategic development project. Registered persons engaged in any specific project. Suppliers who provide value-added services to an exporter, which results in the improvement of the quality character or value of any goods manufactured for export. Persons registered under Section 22.7, that's a long term projects. Any registered person who supplies any goods or services to any registered person mentioned above, if the CGIR is satisfied that the value of supplies exceeds 50% of the total supplies of such supplier. Now, if you were, uh, if the if fifty percent, if more than fifty percent of your total supplies is supplied uh, to a RIP, then you can also become a.
sorry, uh, there was a connection issue from my end. Uh, we were discussing about so we were on the final sum. Question number 11. Right. A, li a limited lease of registered company engaged in the business of manufacturing bags. The company is also registered under a certain scheme as a RIS. The following information is given for the taxable period in the 31st December 2022. Turnover exclusive of VAT without VAT. Local sales 6,984,000. Sales to exporters under a sweat scheme 1,716,000. Input VAT. On imports and local purchases, 343,000. On repairs to motor car used by the CEO, 24,000. The company has collected a sweat credit vouchers of 257,400 on its suspended supplies. So calculate the balance VAT payable for the taxable period in the 31st December 2020. Right. This is the answer. First, we calculate the output VAT. Uh, local sales, value of supply, 6,084,000. On that, we apply the tax rate 15%. The VAT comes to 912,600. Suspended supplies, uh, that, those are the supplies we made to RIPs, 1,716,000. We apply the tax rate, standard tax rate 15%, 257,400. So the total value of taxable supplies, 7.8 million. Output VAT comes to 1,170,000. Then from that, we are going to deduct allowable input VAT. We have uh, input VAT on imports and local purchases, 343,000. That we can deduct. The next one on repairs to motor car used by the CEO, 24,000. Uh, as I explained, input VAT in relation to motor vehicles, cannot be claimed uh, other than certain circumstances. So this is a situation where input VAT is not deductible. So that 24,000 is not claimed. So the total input comes to 343,000. VAT payable, the difference between output VAT and input VAT, 827,000. Now, you don't have to pay this 827,000 because when you supply your, so when you do your services to RIPs, they don't pay you in cash. They give you SWAT credit vouchers, right? So the vouchers that you have collected from your RIPs can be deducted from the VAT payable, right? Though the VAT payable comes to 827,000, you don't have to pay that in cash because you have not collected that in cash. So you are deducting from that liability the value of the credit vouchers, 257,400. So that's the same value. If you look at under output VAT, 
that's the value of suspended supplies. 257,400. So the same amount we are deducting from the wet uh, payable. So the balance, yes, that you have to pay in cash. So here, if you, uh, now you have supplied 1,716,000 worth of uh, suspended supplies. The output rate is 257,400. So in this sum, we have we are deducting the same value. But if you are not collected, it's a credit vouchers. If you are not collected, you can't deduct it here. Then the the value of or the balance that payable will go up. The amount that is payable in cash will go up. So uh, you have to make sure that all asset credit vouchers are collected on time. Uh, that's how you should do adjustments uh, when you have suspended supplies made under the SWAT scheme. Basically, uh, that's about value added tax. If you have questions, I had to I had to run through the presentation. Uh, because of the time constraint. I always have this uh, issue. Mm, I tried my best to uh, cover all the areas, um, but uh, you are, feel free to ask questions if you have any in relation to value added tax. Uh, so students, if you have any clarifications, you can ask or you can put those message uh, in questions into the chat box as well. Uh, it seems there are no questions, sir. So with that, we can wind up the session. So before winding up, uh, on behalf of the department, I would like to thank you uh, for your effort and the time taken to do this lecture. It was very fruitful, sir. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Natasha Mitz, sir, and uh, again, uh, the team and the department for having me. This is the fifth uh, consecutive time I'm doing this presentation. Thank yes, you very sir. much. Uh, uh, this opportunity and uh, wish you all the very best and uh, good night you all. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night.